Praise the Lord, everyone. And we greet you on this 2021 Founders Day celebration. Oh, what an honor and a privilege it is to present what little we know about one of the great men of God of this century, the life and the legend and the legacy and the achievements of Bishop R. C. Lawson. The man known as the cry loud, spare not preacher. Oh, Bishop R. C. Lawson is the founder of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith, uh, which is some 102 years old now. And Bishop Lawson was born in 1883. He died in 1961, but what a legacy he has left for us. He was a man of energy. He was a man of vision, a man of creativity, a man who was scholarly, always adventurous in traveling abroad, doing research. Uh, he was a prayer warrior's prayer warrior because he was one who lived by prayer and depended on God's direction. And as a result, God has used him to establish churches and to establish schools, to establish businesses. And of course, the one of the most predominantly uh, powerful organizations of this century, the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ of the Apostolic Faith. And out of it has come so many movements, so many apostolic Pentecostal movements. So today we come to you and we want to present this wonderful, wonderful man of God, Bishop R.C. Lawson, a man who would write songs and sing those songs, a man of poetry, a man of philosophy, a man of theology, a man of scholarship. And we appreciate him. And the more I study Bishop R.C. Lawson, uh, I thought I knew a little something about him. Uh, but there are many uh, new dimensions about him that I am seeing and discovering every day. You know, there are thousands of people in our lives who touch us, motivate us, and bless us, and influence us. And uh, we all have a natural heritage. We have natural relatives. We have those people who inspire us. But there's nothing more profound than those who have touched our spiritual heritage. And one way or another, Bishop Lawson uh, has touched thousands and thousands of lives while he lived and after his death in 1961. You see, we have a heritage. And what is a heritage? It is that which is handed down, that model, those high standards, uh, that holy living example, those productive actions, those things that are accomplished with excellence. And the Lord, through his servant, Bishop R.C. Lawson, has left us a living legacy to maintain and continue. A living legacy? Yes. A legacy is not just to be placed as if it were a history book. A legacy must continue to live. Those activities, those good things, and the scripture says that we are his workmanship, Ephesians 2.10, created by Christ Jesus unto good works, which he hath before ordained that we should walk in them. We give honor to our presiding apostle, Bishop James I. Clark and Lady James Clark, who on this 2021 Founders Day celebration provide, preside over an organization that is growing around the world. As Bishop Lawson taught us, but I look back on a, a quote, and Marcus Garvey, it was Marcus Garvey, the leader in the 20s, wanted to go to lead the Back to Africa group, but he said something very powerful. 
He said, a people without the knowledge of their past history and their origin and their culture is like a tree without roots. So it is with the life and the works of the late Bishop R.C. Lawson, a giant contributor to our blessed spiritual heritage. As I said before, he was a man of vision. He was a man of energy. And he traveled the world looking and learning. He felt that travel was one of the greatest educators. Um, he established schools that we will touch on. And he was that Bible-centered preacher out of Harlem who was known as the cry loud prayer, uh, spare not preacher, cry loud, spare not. And he used to write that, he wrote that song. He was a prayer warrior's prayer warrior. My mother used to tell me they'd be driving and when six o'clock came, he would have a six o'clock prayer and he'd get in the spirit and raise his hand sometime, they'd be so frightened. But he would go on because he was a morning prayer, a noonday prayer, a sunset prayer person. Bishop Marcy Lawson was a world preacher of the gospel. As I said before, he's a prayer, he was a prayer warrior. He was an organizer. He was a founder of many, many churches. He was a writer of books. He was a writer of songs. He was a writer of poetry. He was a world traveler. And as we will show you later on, he went to the Holy Land, Israel, 39 times. He established more than 200 churches in his lifetime. And he had a clinic in Africa, and he had schools uh, in Africa. We had our school in Boki Town. We had a school in Zui. We had schools all over, and particularly in Southern Pines, North Carolina. He was born on May 5th, 1883, in New Iberia, Louisiana. He was raised by his Aunt Grace. His father, his name was Willie D. Lawson. His mother, Clara Lawson. He became, uh, as he went into adulthood, a singer, a uh, gambler. He was a minstrel singer. He had a voice, melodious voice, uh, that would shake rafters when he sang. And he was uh, a traveler in the West, a gambler. Uh, out in Chicago and other places. But God afflicted him or brought him through affliction. Many times we run away from God. I preached a sermon not too long ago. Uh, it was God will save and use a runaway. And Jonah was an example, but the late Bishop R.C. Lawson was another. He did not want to preach. He did not want to come to Christ. But when God chooses you, he chooses you. And so uh, he left New Iberia, Louisiana, his aunt and his relatives, and he traveled north. Again, he was known in Harlem and all over the country as the cry loud, spared, not preacher. He was the preacher known as God's eagle preacher who could see and fly and stay aloft and soar. Uh, and that scripture says that we will rest on the wings of the eagle. He was a purpose-driven man, a man known on the radio in many places as the Bible answer man. And he would go and answer questions everywhere. But when he became afflicted with tuberculosis, uh, he was in the hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, and he was a roommate of a prize fighter. His mother was a Holy Ghost woman. And when she went to see her son, as we do, or should do, to see the people and greet the people in the room, and she went over to Bishop Lawson's bed and said to him uh, in a very warm, loving way, son, what about your soul? Well. Bishop Lawson treated her kindly, 
but didn't realize the extent of his illness. And this mystery Holy Ghost woman told him about Jesus and what it meant to be saved. And when they brought Bishop Lawson his uh, laboratory report where he might not live more than two months, oh, he remembered that Holy Ghost woman got down on his knees and God saved him. God brought him in from a life that was pointed at death and turned it around into one that is full of life. Today, the Board of Apostles, along with our presiding apostle, James I. Clark, uh, really uh, administer a great organization. But it all goes back to this Holy Ghost woman who testified to Bishop Lawson in the hospital when he discovered that he had almost incurable tuberculosis and God healed his body around 1913 and he was called to the ministry. In his own words, as I said, like Jonah, he was the runaway that God caught up with and saved. So it was not Bishop Lawson. In his own words, I quote to you, you may buck and rear, you may run and hide, but if God has chosen you, he's going to bring you if he has to have kill you. And those are his words. Around 1914, he met and he courted and he married uh, the late Mother Carrie F. Lawson in Fort Levensworth, Kansas, and they had five sons. And they uh, were a couple who were kind of welded together in unity. Mother Lawson was known as the praying woman of the air. And they started out in the ministry. Bishop Lawson was pastoring three churches in the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World. But the Lord told him to come to New York. And he came only with a few dollars in his pocket with no members. And... He went and the Lord told him to follow the first person he saw on the subway, and that was Deacon Eddie Anderson. And he followed Deacon Anderson to his home, and it was in their home on 131st Street that Refuge Temple or the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ was born. Deacon Eddie and Eddie Anderson. And they had prayer meetings in that house. And on Saturdays, they would go to the market and they would preach uh, at the open market up on 140th Street in New York. And many famous preacher, preachers, Gerard Johnson, McKinley Williams, all standing in that front row. And they found a building uh, not far from there, uh, which uh, was uh, three buildings, and 52, 54, 56, 131st Street. And they renovated it. And the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ grew. Bishop Lawson organized the uh, International Missionary Department in 1923. And Mother Lawson was a working woman, husband, I mean, uh, uh, wife, and helped me. But the first president was Mother Elizabeth Brown. And this is in 1923. He established the executive board of the International Missionary Department. So uh, these first senior missionaries, I've interviewed many of them, Mother Wheatley and so many others, but they fixed up 133rd Street into what was known as Beloved Refuge. That was the headquarters. So known so, and they were known uh, as Elder Lawson and Mother Carrie Lawson. And as Bishop Lawson grew, uh, his health and his strength improved. And he was one, uh, it had to take the threat of illness to bring him to come to his senses. And he picked up his Bible and he got it and came forward uh, to preach the gospel throughout the whole world. Uh, in 1931, this was the convention at the beloved Refuge Church on 133rd Street. They call it Hallelujah Square. And uh, Bishop Lawson 
used to live on the third floor. His office was on the second floor, and he traveled the world. He he wrote books. He worked with Mother Ora Wade, and everything took place there on 133rd Street. And uh, later on, um, as he would move to Refuge Temple on 124th Street, Refuge Temple became so large and so filled. But Bishop Lawson knew a lot of notable people who used to visit him and talk with him. Uh, I was delighted to hear that W.E.B. Du Bois sought Bishop Lawson out, the secretary, Sister Dorothy, Daryl told me that she the doorbell rang one night. She went downstairs. It was he looking to talk, W.B.E.B. Du Bois, looking to talk to Bishop R.C. Lawson, another great friend of Bishop Lawson, who we'll talk about a little bit later, but Bishop Charles H. Mason, the founder of the Church of God in Christ. And every time he came to New York, he and Bishop Lawson would fellowship. Bishop Lawson was called a cry loud, spare not preacher because when he saw something that just didn't fit with the word of God, he would blast it. He'd go on the radio. One was such a Bishop Grace, uh, who he used to uh, blast on the radio, not in a way of uh, hate or dislike as much as his error in what he was doing biblically. And Bishop Grace would baptize people with a holes or go and get a fire hose. They have so many people that baptize two or three hundred. So they call him Daddy Grace and he didn't do much physical work. So he would go out and get a fire hose. Bishop Lawson would blast him on the radio. Bishop Lawson had quite a few great mentors and colleagues who also established themselves and God brought them into Pentecost. There was a Bible class that was conducted by Bishop Lawson's mentor, Bishop G.T. Haywood, and they would go through the Bible verbatim seven times a year. And uh, he didn't want them to much read about anything else, but they knew their Bibles. And Bishop Haywood used to have Bible class three days a week and then two twice on Sunday. And these people, and these, these uh, people in Bishop uh, Haywood's class, they knew their Bible. They became presiders themselves, Bishop Samuel Hancock, uh, Bishop uh, Samuel Joshua Grimes, and then there was Elder School, Elder Washington, and the young Bishop Lawson. They were what we call district elders or general elders in the Pentecostal assemblies of the world. And uh, Bishop Lawson was one of the first to go on national radio, and people would come on Sunday night to WBNX broadcast on 133rd Street, and they would pack out for the broadcast. Uh, Bishop Lawson was one who believed and focused on prophecy. He loved the study and the scholarly uh, pursuits of prophecy. His Bible would be located and filled with all kinds of of newspaper articles. I used to carry his Bible for him and I would see it. But he would say, prophecy is being fulfilled with scrupulous exactitude. That was one of his favorite quotes. So Bishop Lawson left a legacy, but he left a legacy that God had given us. He left us something to stand on. He left us something to stand with and something to stand for. A solid rock of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1928, Bishop R.C. Lawson established uh, the Church of Christ Bible Institute, the oldest Bible inst Pentecostal Bible Institute in New York. And uh, today, it still thrives. We're online. All of our courses are online. And uh, we've had distinguished graduates, uh, and people come from all over. But all these years, uh, famous deans like Bishop James I. Clark Sr., and there were others who graduated. Sister De Silva became the first to receive a baccalaureate from the Church of Christ Bible Institute. So that institution has continued to this day.
And Bishop Lawson had quite a very busy life. He would preach on Sunday night on the broadcast, and my mother told me that at the end of the broadcast, that's when he would leave for the South, when the roads were not as heavy with traffic. And he had a Zephyr, and he had, uh, they didn't have many heaters in the car. Those days, they used to do liniment, my mother said. Put that on his feet, and he'd be gone to the South. And in the South, many people would meet him as he traveled and preached, and many groups would sing uh, in uh, Texas and in North Carolina, South Carolina, and they would meet Bishop Lawson in revival. He was an affable, an outgoing man to all people. He loved people. You would always see him uh, during the service and after the service, always around greeting people in the back of the church. He would be so affable. And he was a man on the move teaching and building up the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ all over the world. He went around the world twice, and as I told you before, many other places. He was a Bible scholar. He was an avid reader of the news and world events. I used to run and get the Journal News, the seventh of the latest edition for him, and he would read all of his mail. If you wrote Bishop Lawson a letter, he would respond back to you sometimes in typing. That was a big thing. He was a student of prof prophecy, a world traveler. And uh, on another tape, I'm going to present him talking himself. He did 70,000 miles uh, within a nine-month period on those old prop cranes. Uh, he was a keen marriage counselor. He was a real estate genius, owned property, and would invest in many places. He had a funeral home. He was a publisher. He was a businessman. And most of all, he was a world preacher evangelist. But he was one, and he would be very proud of Bishop Clark and his efforts to lead the social justice department of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ today. Uh, Bishop Lawson was very involved with civil rights and with human rights. And he uh, would fight against uh, segregation and against racial discrimination. In 1957, see, we hear about the March on Washington in 1963, but in 1957, Bishop Lawson was invited to speak. And you can see right behind Bishop Lawson, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King, Dr. Abernathy. You can even see Adam Clayton Powell. Bishop Lawson was right there as a fighter for civil rights. He was there and he would write letters to the editor. He would challenge uh, biblical doctrines that were off. He was a civic worker and people would seek him for his research and his writings and his teachings. And he would spend hours in the office. My mother told me at night after dinner, he would go down to his office and be in the office writing songs, writing poetry, reading, studying, and uh, building up. He believed in uh, private school education, boarding school education, and a religious atmosphere. So in 1933, the Industrial Union of America, the Methodist Church, gave Bishop Lawson some property in Southern Pines, North Carolina, that's where all of our, and he established a school for young people to leave the city and to be taught in a spiritual atmosphere. And his vision was carried on by the late uh, Ethel May Bonner when she went to Africa. She established the R.C. Lawson Institute of Liberia. And Bishop Lawson would sit with a king or he would work and visit the palace of Emperor Selassie, then go and go into Liberia in the water holes and baptize people by the hundreds himself. He was that affable personality that was always greeting you with warmth. Uh, in 1927, he established the Contender for the Faith magazine, the publication, the official organ of the Church of Our Lord Jesus Christ, and from there, he wrote many articles. He was able to communicate with the organization. And he, that is continued 
to this day, and I'm very proud to be a part of that effort as an editor. So we appreciate the establishment of the Contender for the Faith today. And not only do we have the magazine, but now we have a uh, web site. We have a YouTube channel. It's called Contender for the Faith History Channel. There you will see much of Bishop Lawson's work. Today, we also honor uh, the granddaughter, Sister Ella DeVita Lawson, who lives uh, lived in Harlem and attended the Greater Refuge Temple Church, lives in Pennsylvania now, but she's the oldest living granddaughter and grandchild of Bishop R.C. Lawson. Time will not permit all the people who work with Bishop Lawson, uh, Bishop Charles Leader, who was the electrician. Bishop Lawson would send Ella Edward S. Harris. He would send Bishop Thomas Richardson to South Carolina. He would send Mother Dorothy Anderson to many places. Bishop H.T. Jones, Bishop Blodgett, and of course, Bishop W.L. Bonner. Uh, Mother J Giles, he went to Africa and Mother Brooks and Mother Wade as they sat at the airport to send Sister Giles to Liberia, West Africa. Bishop Rowe, Bishop Norwood, uh, Mother Delphi Perry, uh, Mother Margaret Giles Johnson, who didn't want to go to Africa, but the Lord told her to go to Africa. And then, of course, that foreign missionary, that outstanding uh, person who was mentored by Bishop Lawson, Apostle W.O. Bonner, built school in Africa, built churches in Africa. And as I said before, Bishop Lawson traveled to the Holy Land 39 times. He visited all the places we've been fortunate enough to visit. He had many helpers, Mother Lita, Mother Keith, Mother Maloney, uh, Mother uh, Juanita Sorio, all these great people work with him. He had a home up in Shrubble, New York, and we were a part of that, our family, and we were invited up every summer to live on the 60-acre farm. He had a hotel, he had a cemetery, he had uh, where a swimming pool up there, and uh, he placed a sign at the door, and you can see it slightly there on the left, and it was a place up in Putnam County, Shrub Oak. And the sign read from Wordsworth's poem, Let me live in the house by the side of the road and be a friend to man. So my mother was raised by Bishop Lawson from age 12, and we were all a part of Bishop Lawson's family life, and we got to know him as children. But I had a chance uh, up until the time I went to the college to talk with him and to laugh with him and for him to show me his library and show me photographs. He enjoyed his shrub oak place, the farm. A major point that we will get to, and we're creating a, a tape of its own about the impact of Bishop Lawson on the Pentecostal world. Uh, Bishop Lawson was not saved in Azusa Street, but out of Azusa Street came a man, depending, and then the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World, and then Bishop Lawson established uh, the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ in 1919. But out of the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ has come 11 other organizations. Time will not permit me to go through all those founders and all those organizations, but thousands of people, not only in the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ, have come to God through his ministry, but through all these other movements that have come out. And look on YouTube, because we're going to have a special tape on the impact of the Lawson ministry on Pentecost and the apostolic world. We cannot forget some of his major helpers, Mother Mabel L. Thomas, who compiled his books and his articles. She'd come in from high school and pull out his tape recorder and she would transcribe. And Bishop Arthur Anderson, 
who was his business and church secretary. And he wrote the book called In the Defense of the Gospel. Bishop Lawson was uh, very associated with many famous names. Fats Waller, for an example. His father was a deacon at 133rd Street. Uh, we had civic leaders. He was a great friend of Paul Robeson, the all-American baritone, who Russia, because of his travels and the Russian people loved him, they took his passport. He had no means of income. Bishop Lawson let him sing at Refuge Temple. The Emperor of Ethiopia, who we will talk about later, Sugar Ray Robinson, the middleweight champion of the world, his mother belonged to the Greater Refuge Temple Church. Gardner Taylor, the great and legendary pastor of the Concord Baptist Church in Brooklyn. He and Bishop Lawson uh, came out of New Iberia, Louisiana together, and uh, Bishop uh, or Reverend Taylor was called the man with the golden tongue. And he and I had a great relationship. I sent him copies of the books that we had written about Bishop Lawson, and he sent me tapes of his sermons. A great man of God who died at the age of 97 down in North Carolina. He knew Adam Clayton Powell Sr. during the Depression when they used to feed the people and give food out. And of course, Adam Clayton Powell Jr., who was the congressman. He knew President Eisenhower. He knew, as I said, Bishop Mason. He knew Adam Clayton Powell Sr. He knew Mayor Wagner of New York. Uh, he knew Dr. King and, of course, Gardner Taylor. So his civil rights record. And in 1953, Ebony conducted a survey, and Bishop Lawson was uh, voted as one of the top black ministers in the United States by Ebony Magazine, and uh, he was asked by a reporter, Bishop Lawson, what is your formula for success? And Bishop Lawson said, quite simple, find the will of God, get in the will of God, and stay in the will of God. You do those three things, everything is going to be all right. We appreciate Deacon Du, who is very close to Mother Delphia Perry. And then there's a young man standing behind Bishop Lawson, who was his chauffeur, who would later uh, pick up the mantle and take up the challenge. On our original Board of Apostles was Bishop William L. Barnum, Bishop H. D. Spencer, and Bishop H. D. Jones, Bishop Purnell. And we had... Uh, these ministers formed the successive of Bishop Lawson. But the man who received that mantle was Bishop W. L. Barnum. Uh, and in 1960, which was the last convention in Detroit, Bishop Barnum dedicated the church there. And I always say it takes a difference maker to make things change, and that difference maker is God. And the next comes the man. Bishop Lawson was a great friend of the Emperor of Ethiopia. Now, you might not think that's very important, but His Majesty uh, and Bishop Lawson were great friends. He promised Bishop Lawson, and I have it on tape on another uh, uh, workshop that we'll give during this foundation, but he promised Bishop Lawson land to build a school in Ethiopia. And then uh, Ethiopian students were given scholarships to the R.C. Lawson Institute in Southern Pines. He received the Star of, in of Ethiopia, which is the highest star award one can get, Bishop R.C. Lawson and Mayor Wagner. Bishop Lawson would go to the palace of uh, Emperor Selassie of Ethiopia, and when the, the Emperor Selassie came to New York, and stayed at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel, Bishop Lawson was right there. And I just recently learned that Bishop Lawson had the Emperor of Ethiopia in 1953 when he visited the United States. He went out to Bishop Lawson's home in Pelham, New York. I understand the Secret Service was out there and everyone was out there, but he had and went to visit 
Bishop Lawson in his home in Pelham Manor, New York, uh, with diplomats and people from all over the world. He really appreciated the Star of Ethiopia Award, but he had a significant appreciation for Selassie because if you know your Bible, the Queen of Sheba uh, and Solomon had a relationship. And uh, King Solomon and uh, Queen of Sheba traveled uh, for the wisdom, to find out the wisdom of Solomon. And they had a child. His name was Milanet, the first. He was the king of Ethiopia. That was the link of bringing uh, Judaism uh, and the word of God to Ethiopia. Now, that line continued because if you look at the genealogy of the Lord Jesus Christ, you will find that Jesus came from the line of Judah. And so it was with Solomon, and so it was with Melanie. And the scripture backs it up in Genesis 49, 10, and it says, The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh comes, who is Shiloh, the Lord Jesus Christ, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. So Bishop Lawson studied the black history of the Bible, Ham, Cush, Put, Mizraim, Nimrod, the sons of Canaan, and he wrote books. He wrote a book back in 1938, uh, The Anthropology of Jesus Christ, Our Kinsman, and people still fight for a copy of that book. He studied the genealogy and the history of blacks in the Bible. And I saw a book recently that said the Bible is black history. So today we have all kinds of seminars, but we note the great people of color in the Bible. Bishop Lawson was known as a writing scholar. Douglas Jacobson wrote a book, The Reader in Pentecostal Theology. And who is one of those he featured? Bishop R.C. Lawson. He featured Bishop C.H. Mason. He featured uh, Bishop G.T. Haywood. He, uh, uh, he, he did so much in this book. Uh, there's uh, Ershon, who was with the UPC. And it's quite a book, Voices from the First Generation. Uh, that's Douglas Jacobson. And he thought it uh, my privilege. He asked me for permission to use Bishop Lawson's picture. But what an honor it was for him to write about Bishop R.C. Lawson. Bishop Lawson had some great help. God sent him the late Dr. Ethel May Barnes. She was a writer. She was a speaker. She was a foreign missionary. She was an educator, par excellence. And she was the wife of Bishop Barnes. Uh, Sister Susie Woodside, a um, woman that took care of Bishop Lawson's funeral home, Sister Elsie Shell Taylor, Sister Elizabeth Wilson, Mother Mary Durant, oh, I could go on, Mother Bessie Jones, and Mother, uh, who was the head of the prayer band, 12 o'clock prayer band, for 40 years. And then the great Mabel Thomas, who uh, I was privileged to write a book with her, The Life, Legend, and Legacy of Bishop R.C. Lawson. Bishop Lawson own a funeral home. Bishop Lawson owned a real estate company. Bishop Lawson owned, it was called Putnam Valley Resort Rest Center. And many African Americans could leave the hot city in the summer and come up to the cottages and come up where it was a swimming pool. And uh, on 133rd Street, Bishop Lawson had a grocery store. He had the Church of Christ Publishing Company where he would grind out his own tracts and his own literature. And that came from Bishop Haywood, his mentor. And then he's buried at the Larksburg Cemetery in Putnam, New York. And he enjoyed all kinds of business in, uh, ventures. One was raising little beagle puppies. And so some of the songs written by Bishop R.C. Lewis, Praise Thy Name, We Need a Vision of the Christ. Worthy is the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. O thou beautiful one, 
His name shall be praised. God is great, greatly to be praised. The shepherd's calling the sheep. Come, Lord Jesus, out of Egypt. These are just some of the songs that Bishop Lawson would write and put into a songbook. We call it Songs for Christ. And you see, praise thy name, and we'd have the music, and we would have the written word. Mother Mabel Thomas and myself, we were honored to write a book about the life, legend, and legacy of Bishop R.C. Lawson, and we're about to revise it and republish it. Uh, I've written facts and photos about our founders, and uh, each year they have this Founders Day celebration. Uh, we have uh, Mother Norbel Powell. We have uh, many people who come in from the organization, and the real driver is uh, Dr. Celeste Johnson down the bottom right-hand corner, and also our chairman, uh, Bishop Whitaker Wright. And uh, each year, they have a service in Refuge Temple, uh, and there's a committee that works, and they plan the Founders Day, and uh, it's a wonderful gathering of the people of God, uh, along with the Board of Bishops. We commend Dr. Johnson, Dr. Celeste Johnson, and her husband, uh, the late uh, Bishop William Johnson, who kept the Founders Day program alive. We had a service each year over the grave site of Bishop Lawson. And Bishop Clark presides over it. We've had some great speakers. And every year, we go up to Peekskill and we build a canopy over the grave site of Bishop Lawson. So on this Founders Day, we come uh, here, we have this church service up by the grave site. Some of the books written by Bishop Lawson, one, The Anthropology of Jesus Christ, Our Kinsman, How Sin, Why the Cross. He wrote a book on Revelation, and he goes into depth on all of what Revelation, that mystery, that revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. He wrote, what is self glorification? He wrote seven reasons why we baptize in Jesus' name. He wrote, Jesus Christ of the New Testament is Jehovah God of the Old. He wrote the burning question, marriage and divorce. I've been fortunate enough to represent the name and represent the Church of our Lord Jesus Christ in many places. And recently I was invited, and you see Bishop Clark's sister there and others, but we were invited up to Shrub Oak to talk about Bishop Loss. They wanted to know about Bishop Loss in a predominantly white audience. We presented the life and the legacy of Bishop R.C. Lawson, that affable man, that outgoing man, that man who will always gr greet you. And then, as we finalize now, there were many books written about Bishop Lawson. A Blessed Life in the Making, that was uh, written by Mother Oral Wade back in the 30s. In the Defense of the Gospel, Bishop Arthur Anderson. My Father in the Gospel, written by Bishop W. L. Bonner. The Life, Legend, and Legacy of Bishop R.C. Lawson by Dr. Yours truly, Dr. Robert Spellman, and Mother Mabel L. Thomas, and Bishop Lawson by Deacon Alexander Stewart. So I enjoy quotes that stick with me. A person who inspires you, they don't leave you. Their quotes don't leave you. So one of those quotes that Bishop Lawson made that was so meaningful to me, and it went like this. There's no such thing as good luck. <laughs> it is all good God. It is all consistent, prayerful living. It is all hard work. And it is all sound judgment. Another quote, which I have printed here, but it's very, very unique, 
He said, my greatest teachers were those who saw something in me that I hadn't seen in myself. And they told me about it. And I acted upon it. So uh, we want to, we have produced, and during this Founders Day, uh, we want to present uh, you many short excerpts of the life of Bishop Lawson. Uh, all of the things that he is doing and how his legacy continues to this day. We're looking at many new, newly discovered dimensions of Bishop Lawson. Lawson's special relationship with Bishop C.H. Mason. We're going to put that on a YouTube tape by itself in this Founders Day. Lawson as a scholarly world traveler. Lawson and her, his relationship to Emperor Haley Selassie. Lawson and his scholarship in biblical black history. And last, Lawson's influence on the birth and development of Pentecostal apostolic organizations all over the world. So we salute and we give honor to, but we give God the glory to the late Bishop R.C. Lawson. We give our commitment to as long as we have breath in our body and uh, energy that God gives us to keep that legacy, not about a man as much as his work.